Hi, everybody. I'm Greg, senior pastor here at Park Avenue Church in Minneapolis. Thank you for connecting with us in worship. If you're a newcomer to Park, I want to extend a special welcome to you, let you know that you matter to us, and we're so grateful, so glad that you're here. And if you'd like more information about Park, just drop us a line at info at parkabchurch.org. We'd love to connect with you. And I say this every week, but we want to include as many people as we can in the goodness that is Park Avenue Church. So if you're participating with us on Facebook or YouTube, I wonder if you take just a second to click the share button in your Facebook or YouTube app to invite other folks that you know to participate. Now, a couple of things I'm really excited to tell you about. First, I wonder if you'll meet me today following this service in the gathering room um, for a time to greet one another and meet new friends. We'll, we'll, send, uh, we'll, we'll send you a link. So all you got to do is send an email to us saying something like, let me in to info at parkhavechurch.org, and then you'll receive a link back from us promptly. And you just got to click that link and join about 10 after 1. Secondly, I know how important giving is to us. So in this long season of not being able to worship together in our sanctuary, we're trying to make it easier for all of us to make an offering to give. And one of the easiest ways is to text your gift amount to Park's new text to give phone number, 888-318-8032. Just open the text app on your phone, type in 888 888- 318-8032, and then in the text field, enter the amount you want to give as a whole number, no decimals or dollar sign, and then press send. For example, if you want to give 20 bucks, thank you, enter your gift as 20, not 20.00 or dollar t- sign 20, and then you press send and you'll receive a link to complete your offering securely. I've used it myself. It works great. So thank you for your faithfulness, and thank you for being here today to worship with Park Online. I hope to see you in the virtual gathering room immediately following our service from about 110 to 130. And now, here's Darrell Williams with our call to worship. Darrell? Thank you, Pastor Greg. Well, good morning, Park Avenue. This is Darrell Williams, the youth director. As we receive the call to worship today, let us prepare our hearts and our minds for the Word of God. Who among us is exempt from an awakening? At one point or another, we all have fell asleep at the spiritual will in this journey. Current events have shaken our roads. This is now the intersection where we collide with truth. And what does it mean to be woke? Well, in the Urban Dictionary, it means being aware, knowing what's going on in the community as it relates to racism and social economical injustice. And what does it mean to be woke spiritually? I would imagine that it has something to do with the transformation of our minds, of our hearts, and our beliefs. To seeing one another the way that God sees us all. Park Avenue, today, I pray that this service wakes us from a spiritual slumber. Amen. To know you is to love you. To place no one above you To know your ways, to trust you With all my heart and soul And to know you is to follow where you lead To heed the words you speak To know you, to know you is to serve you, to give of raises to you, to know you is to seek you with every passing day, and 
Shalom Park Avenue. I want to welcome and invite you to pray with me. Prayer is our lifeline to God and believers in Christ. Prayer is simply talking to God. Wherever you are viewing this, Christ invites us into friendship and fellowship with Him. Please join me as we pray to God who is waiting to hear from us. We are grateful to you, God, that you are listening to us right now. We give pause to give thanks to you for keeping us to this point. Our hearts are full of gratitude for your mercy and grace towards us. Thank you that you and your mercy and grace, you give us peace. You give us peace in the midst of trouble, trouble from just living life. Trouble comes in sickness. Trouble comes in this pandemic. Trouble comes in forms of injustice and trouble just comes and has a way of finding us in life. The old saying, trouble won't last always, that is only because you are our peace. We need that peace to console others who are suffering from grief. We need your peace when we are faced with evictions and job losses. We need your peace when we are in the dark, dark valley of oppression and depression. You, Jesus, help us find a way when it looks like there is no way. We want to be your peacemakers. Jesus, grant us joy and peace that will transform us to be more like you. We will continue to cry out to you, Jesus, because in you we can rise above any adversity that comes at us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. We love to pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray, and that is so powerful. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, 
Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. 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 Forever and ever. Amen. Hello, Park Avenue. It's time now to worship God through our giving. But first, let's lift our voices together and sing. Romans chapter 12 verse 13 says, Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. And during this time of social distancing, you can do just that by giving on our website, parkabchurch.org slash give. Thank you and be blessed. Today's scripture reading, Matthew 15, 21 through 28. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. This is the word of God for the people of God. Say it with me. Thanks be to God. Okay, <laughs> can, I, can I go ahead and name the elephant in the room here and say what I suppose just about everyone is thinking or has thought? Hey, Jesus, what's up with the attitude? I mean, I get the disciples screaming at you to send this woman away. I mean, that's kind of their thing, especially when the needs of other people infringe upon their sensibilities. But you, insinuating that she's a dog? A racist term, by the way, just because she's not from your tribe? Excuse me, but hey, Jesus, what's up with the privilege? If I remember correctly, on the day you were born, didn't Magi, definitely not Jewish, travel a very long way from the east to kneel down at the trough you were sleeping in and, and then offer you gifts of, what was it, gold, frankincense, and myrrh? And... 
And, and, and didn't an angel announce your birth to shepherds living in a field, not exactly considered folks to be on God's guest list, to tell them that your birth signaled good news and great joy for all people, which included outcast, unclean shepherds like them. Doesn't all mean all? And aren't you the one who erases cultural and social economic gender, racial, and religious lines drawn by people a little too full of themselves who take it upon themselves to judge those who's deserving of God's attention and who isn't? Why are you digging your own line in the sand here? Come on, Jesus. What's up with this? Okay, I said it. <laughs> what do you think? Too much? What in the world is going on here? The truth is, this disturbing passage has long been a challenge for biblical scholars and people of faith. Uh, perhaps it's left you scratching your head as well. One commentator suggests that the key to making sense of this disturbing passage is this question. You ready? Here's the question. Did this outsider, Gentile Canaanite woman, pass a test or did she persuade Jesus? And now, um, the more traditional interpretation, answer to that question, that Jesus was, Jesus was giving her a faith test, suggests that Jesus didn't really mean the hurtful stuff he said about excluding her from the God Club and calling her a dog. Uh, Jesus was just trying to pull out of her the faith that was already in her. The biblical scholar F.F. F. Bruce, as well as others, try to soften Jesus' dog comment by pointing out that the word translated dogs is the diminutive form of the word, and it means puppy. And so this interchange between Jesus and the Gentile woman is this sort of back and forth, playful wordplay. Jesus calls her a dog, a puppy with a twinkle in his eyes. So goes the argument, something which you have to read between the lines to catch. But honestly, to me, this rings a bit hollow, and it seems like an attempt to protect Jesus from looking like he really messed up here. But there's another possibility. Is this a story about a Canaanite, strike one, a Gentile, strike two, and a woman, strike three, persuading a Jewish man, Jesus, Messiah, to change his mind? What if her determination her passion, her great belief in him and God's mission in the world are so compelling that Jesus has to admit that she's right and he has to change his mind. Now, I can hear some folks saying, well, that, that would mean that Jesus was wrong and Jesus can't be wrong, can he? Well, that's a good question. I've asked it myself. But think about this. If what the Bible says about Jesus continuing to grow in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and people is true, then wouldn't you have to assume his growth in wisdom had to include learning from others, at least from time to time? And when this courageous, risk-taking, determined outsider woman pleads for his help on behalf of her ill daughter, she reminds Jesus that his good news mission is God's good news mission, and it's good news for everyone everywhere. So could it be that this Canaanite, this outsider woman, who the disciples want nothing to do with and want Jesus to have nothing to do with, that she is so motivated by this expanding inclusion of God's compassion that she reminds Jesus of what the prophet Isaiah dreamed hundreds of years before. Isaiah 56, thus says the Lord, Isaiah says, maintain justice and do what is right. For soon my salvation will come and my deliverance will be revealed. Thus says the Lord God, who gathers the outcasts of Israel, I will gather others to them besides those already gathered here. Jesus remembers, he's persuaded, and he's moved by the same divine compassion that compels this woman to risk shame and rejection to move heaven and earth for her daughter's healing. 
And we're able to see in real time how Jesus reboots and resets himself in alignment with God's dream for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven for all people. No barriers, no walls, no exclusive memberships to the God Club. So Jesus speaks the word and heals her daughter. This woman is the conduit of compassion through which Jesus' healing of her daughter flows. So I want to suggest to you that this story is about recognizing the ways that we've miscalculated just how extensive and expansive and abundant and flourishing this kingdom of God is. It's a story about stretching boundaries. It's a confrontation between exclusion and exclusion, exclusion and inclusion of who's out and who's in, who's excluded and included, loathed and loved, rejected and welcomed. It challenges ingrained notions of religious bigotry and moves us from doors slammed shut to throwing the doors wide open. If Jesus can be pushed by an outsider to realize God's kingdom is bigger than the cultural, racial, gender, and religious influence of his life, you know what? We can too. And this is also a story about great faith. More to the point, it's a story of the great surprise of great faith from someone outside the faith. When Jesus calls this woman, this Gentile excluded outsider, a woman of great faith, you know what? He's acknowledging the flow of God's mercy and compassion through her. He validates her so that the disciples who wanted to send her away and every one of us who have thought the same thing will forever hold her in honor and we will respect her great faith as a model to follow. So seeing her life as an example, what is this great faith? Just a couple of things. Great faith expands territory and stretches boundaries to ensure that nothing, no thing, no person, no cultural or religious system can separate us from the love of God or each other. That's the Apostle Paul, right? Great faith is fierce in its relentless, single-minded pursuit of God's healing and wholeness for others. It encourages you to be a single-minded servant of that possibility. It has an ultimate mission to see the compassion of God flow through you to everyone and into every situation you encounter to reconcile and restore anything separating any person from God's goodness and wholeness. And when it comes up against obstinance and obstacles, which it will, great faith embodies persistent creativity to make a way when there seems to be no way. It does not give up on imagining new possibilities or different ways forward to ensure we break through the barriers uh, before us of, of us and them thinking and living. It does whatever it takes to erase lines in the sand drawn by those who would seek to judge who's worthy of God's grace and who's not. It will do whatever it takes to tear down walls built to insulate those who perceive themselves as God's chosen while excluding those deemed unworthy. Great faith sees God's love and goodness for all people and tears down tribalism in all its forms. It eliminates pocket-sized perspectives of God that lead to puniness and empowers you to think like God thinks, to love like God loves, and then repent of anything, any thinking or behavior that gets in the way of that. You know, I've, um, I've spent a lot of time among people with deeply held, sometimes debilitating belief in, uh, beliefs in what they assume is their inherent badness. People who feel unworthy of acceptance, who feel inadequate to love and be loved, and who see themselves as hopelessly irredeemable, incapable of knowing God's grace. Uh, a friend of mine told me one time, for most of my life it seems, much of what I was taught is that God is only for good people. She was convinced that she was beyond the embrace of love. She says, that wasn't me, good people. My question has always been, is there a God for bad people like me? I never thought there was. My heart hurt when I heard her say that. 
So look, this is a story of great faith from outside the faith. It's for people like my friend. It's a story to let her know that the degrading, you don't measure up to God's standards message she received from people who were inside the faith, that's lies. This is a story for anyone who has experienced the shame and pain of being wounded by the church or by people of faith. For you, church wounded, faith injured, and God shamed, this is a story for you, for you, who've been told that because of who you are, where you come from, or what you've done or not done, what you look like or don't look like, that God's grace for you has long passed its expiration date. This story is for you. It's for you who, who've been told you don't belong, that you're not included, and you're not welcome. This story is for you. For you who've been side-eyed and dressed down and diminished by spiritual shade thrown on you. This story is for you. For you who've been disrespected, dishonored, and told you're a disgrace, this story of grace is for you. And this story about a woman with great faith, considered by others to be outside the faith, who believed no barricade, guarded by self-appointed Religious border police is strong enough to stop God's agape activated compassion. That story is for all of us. This is a story that has our picture on it, Park Avenue. It speaks into the vision of who we are and who we seek to be. A vibrantly Christ-centered, multiracial, multi-ethnic, intergenerational instrument of transformation actively engage with our urban neighborhood and world. We are a church with great faith to break through barriers that seek to divide any of us. Now consider this. If God invited you to a party, wrote Hafez, and said, everyone in the ballroom tonight will be my special guest, how would you then treat them when you arrived? Indeed, Indeed, and I know that there is no one in this world who is not standing upon God's jeweled dance floor. Elisha Ruhama, Parker Williams. What stands out to me is like how she didn't stop calling for Jesus. Like, she never stopped. She kept on asking and asking, even though she knew that she wasn't allowed to talk to any man because of who she was, but that didn't matter to her. She was taking a really big risk for her daughter, and she had a lot of faith in Jesus. She believed that he could definitely make it work. Amen. Yeah. Tribalism devastates a flow and breaks a rhythm of oneness. Compartmentalizes the capacity of compassion. Yes, my lineage is Canaanite and it's pitch black where I live, so pardon me if I caught the glare of your shine. Son of David, Look me in the eye and tell me you can't feel my rain. As tears fall, the fear falls off my face. I know who I am and I don't forget my place. Yes, I'm risking it all. You may call me a dog, but I have a bone to null off. I know you heard me shouting from a distance. And I pray that this persistence will penetrate your heart. I don't take these risks for me. And I plead that you set my daughter free. You're the only hope that I've come to believe. You're the only freedom my eyes can see. See past this racism, legalism, and every ism that keeps us in prison. He replied and said, I have great faith. 
he looked at his initial mistake and showed a compassion that was too real to fake. Expressed the grace that was greater than race, greater than time, and greater than space. As we say at the end of each service, I can do all things through Jesus Christ, who strengthens me. And together, we can do all things through Jesus Christ, who strengthens us. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. It means a lot that you're here with us. We pray that this has been a meaningful and inspiring experience for you. Let us know how we can connect with you further, or if you'd like information about being involved at Park, send us an email at info at parkavchurch.org. The work of Park Avenue Church is sustained by generous people who include Park in their financial giving. You can give safely and securely by following this link. Thank you, and God bless.